Hello there. In today's lesson, we will start talking about Gauss law, one of the most important laws in electrodynamics, which uh, it actually is one of the four equations, that, four laws that combine make Maxwell's equations, which are considered to be Newton's laws of electrodynamics. The first new concept we need to discuss is the concept of electric flux or flux of a vector field. And I'm going to start making a very, very brief analogy with the idea of, let's just consider that we have some kind of, I don't know, wall with an opening. And we have a significant amount of water coming in. And the flow of water through this here, we can somehow try to define as perhaps a product of the density of water that is going through multiplied by the surface area of that opening. That will give you an idea about the amount of water that goes through. Keep this in mind as we are now preparing the idea for electric flux. And I'm going to define electric flux through several different small examples until we build the final idea. So situation number one is basically this here. In here, I'm posting the perspective picture of the textbook. And this here is my side view. So we have a surface of area A. And let's start considering a uniform electric field E horizontal or pointing to the right, which could be the X axis. And there is going to be some kind of flow of the field through the surface area. And this flow of the field, we're going to call electric flux. And the same way that we defined the water flow as the density of water through the surface area, I can think that electric flux would be somehow a density of the field lines going through the surface area A. So we'll define electric flux as capital Phi as being the product of the electric field multiplied by the surface area. Okay? So that is my very first idea. Now, let's see a second situation here. Let's consider now that my surface, it's not exactly perpendicular to the electric field, but it is slanted. It makes an angle theta with the vertical direction, with the perpendicular to the electric field. Okay? And there is the picture of the book that shows this to us in a very nice uh, perspective. Okay? Uh, the thing is that the surface A2 is bigger than my original surface A1. But, this is the thing, the number of field lines going through A2 is the same as the number of field lines going through A1. So the flux should somehow be the same. Which shows me that what really matters when we think about electric flux is not the total surface, but actually the surface perpendicular to the field. And the surface perpendicular to the field is going to be the surface itself multiplied by the cosine of the angle. So I can improve my definition of electric flux to be Ea cosine of theta. Now, every time we have a vector multiplied by sine or cosine with the direction that the vector will do with some direction, uh, we think about projection of a vector, components. So one thing that we can do in this point is define, for example, a unit vector normal to the surface This unit vector would then make an angle theta with the electric field. And we can define a kind of vector like A as being A in the n hat direction. 
If I do this, my concept of flux can then be adjusted to E dot A, which it's better described as E dot A n hat. And then E multiply dot n hat becomes E cosine of theta, and then I get the equation I had before. Notice that this definition here also allows me to think about electric flux as being the normal component of the electric field multiplied by the area. So I can either consider the flux as being the field multiplied by the component of the area that is perpendicular to the field, or the component of the field perpendicular to the area multiplied by the area. So in the last screen, we had that electric flux, we are defining it at this point as E dot A n hat. In order to move forward, let us see uh, one more situation in here. Let's consider that in my water analogy, that my container is not just a wall, but it is like a water box. And we do have some water striking here. And then striking in here. And now I have the flux of the water through one surface, through one of the areas. I'm going to call this here area A1. And then the flux of the water through the second area, A2. And you see that the impact of these two uh, is different. Because through area A1, that flux is actually producing water that goes into the container with a tendency of increasing the amount of water inside of the container. And through A2, I have water that goes out of the container with a tendency of decreasing the amount of water inside of it. So when I have an enclosed box, uh, I also need now to start distinguishing the idea of flux that goes in and flux that goes out. I had forgotten to make one general observation, which I would like to work on it quickly right now, which is this here. If I have an electric field like this. And I have a surface that is parallel to the field. So here's my surface. We can see that there are no field lines that go through the electric field. So, sorry, through the surface. Therefore, the flux of the electric field on this situation should be zero. And if we actually go back to our definition of electric flux, we will see that the angle between the electric field and the unit vector normal to the surface is 90 degrees. Okay? And if that angle is 90 degrees, then E dot n hat is going to be zero. Okay, so let's now consider the situation that I have here, a perspective picture. Uh, we have a cube. This cube uh, is placed in a way that one of the vertex is on the origin of an XYZ reference frame. Uh, two faces are parallel to the YZ plane. Two faces are parallel to the XY plane, and two faces are parallel to the uh, ZY plane. Okay, and then I have an electric field, horizontal or in the X direction that goes through the cube. In here, I have my side view. So we have the X axis, the Y axis, my electric field uh, on the X direction only, and this is a view of the cube. So I can see here surface A1, which is perpendicular to the electric field and at the origin of my reference frame. Surface A2, 
also perpendicular to the electric field, but on the other end. And surface A3, perhaps, is right here parallel to the picture of the board and parallel to the electric field. Then surface A4 on the top, also parallel. Surface A5 and then surface A6. We see that the electric flux total is going to be the electric flux through surface 1 plus electric flux through surface 2 plus electric flux through surface 3 plus electric flux, and this got a little bit messed up, through surface 6. But the thing is that surface 3 is parallel to electric field, 4 is parallel to electric field, 5 is parallel to electric field, 6 is also parallel to the electric field. So all of these guys here have a total flux of 0. Okay? Every one of them has a flux of 0. And then, at the end of the day, I have that the total flux through my cube is now going to be just flux 1 plus flux 2. Now, you see that this cube now is an enclosed surface. It's not an open surface. So I need to compare better with my example of the water box, not just the wall with the water going in. So when I have the water coming in in one side, I have a tendency to increase the amount of water inside of the box. The water going out on the other side, a tendency to decrease the water inside of the box. These two uh, uh, fluxes have an opposite effect on the overall flux of the box. And I should somehow reason this the same way in here. Uh, the number of lines getting in through this side is equal to the number of lines getting out on the other side. And if I think about a net flux as being this total flux, I should somehow have this to be zero. So I would say that this total flux should be zero. At least this is my idea at this point. If we now stick to our normal vector, I, before I just said the normal unit vector is perpendicular to the surface. But now to address this difference between getting in and getting out, I want to make one more addition. I will say that the normal vector is a vector perpendicular to the surface, but that it points outwards. Okay? So it's always pointing outwards of the surface and perpendicular. In that way, I have that the flux of the electric field through surface a1, which is E dot A1 and hat the first surface, that one, sorry, is going to be negative. And the flux through my surface A2, which is going to be E dot A2 and hat to the second direction, sorry, this one is going to be positive. Because through A1, the two vectors are in opposite directions. Their dot product is negative. On A2, the two vectors are in the same direction. And then the dot product is going to be positive. And in that way, considering all of the symmetries, we have that the total flux is zero, as we would expect. Well, so far, in our ideas of electric flux, we only consider a uniform electric field and surfaces that were flat, kind of rectangular or, or square shaped. And the flux was very easy to be calculated. But what if we have something irregular, like the picture shows us, uh, whether the surface is not normally shaped or the electric field itself changes from point to point? How do we calculate the electric flux then? How do we redefine electric flux for this more general situation? And in here we have, then, my representation of the system, a side view, a cut. So this is a portion of my surface. This is the inner side of my surface. This is the external side. And the electric field at some point. So what I'm going to do is consider an infinitesimal area dA. Okay, and this infinitesimal area dA is actually dA and hat. 
uh, in a way that the electric field on that infinitesimal area, Pa, remains relatively constant. Sorry, remains constant. It does not change in that infinitesimal area. Then, the infinitesimal flux, d phi, from, through this infinitesimal area, dA, is E dot dA, or E dot dA n hat. And the total flux through the entire surface is going to be the summation of all of those infinitesimal contributions, which really becomes just the integral over the surface of E dot dA n hat. Okay? And surface integral, we use a symbol, a little circle like this, to indicate that this is integrating over the surface of, the, of my imaginary surface. Uh, I could also then just write that the flux total is then going to be the surface area of E dot N, which is E N dA. And this then becomes our final version of the definition of electric flux. Once we have electric flux well defined for us as the surface integral of E and dA, we can now actually state Gauss law and see a couple of the consequences of it. So what Gauss law says is basically that the electric flux through an enclosed surface, enclosed surface, is equal to the amount of charge inside of the surface divided by epsilon naught. So this here is now Gauss law statement, which if we now remember our idea, our definition of flux as being the surface integral of the normal field multiplied by dA, I can say that I can say that the surface integral of the electric field uh, over my imaginary surface is equal to the charge inside and close inside of the surface divided by epsilon naught. Now let's talk a little bit about a couple more things and a couple applications or just how we can uh, understand this law better. So far, I've just used generic surfaces. So when you have a charge system, okay, um, let's say a system that has, for example, a positive charge, like this, maybe, and I draw around here some surface, okay? This surface we will start calling actually a Gaussian surface. And because the amount of charge inside of that surface is positive, I have that the electric flux through this first surface is going to be positive. Now, what does that mean? It means that even if I have an external electric field, okay, uh, created by external charges, perhaps something like this, uh, when I combine that with the flux of the charges created inside, I'm going to have more field lines exiting the surface than entering the surface. A similar situation would happen if I had negative charges inside of my surface. So if now I have a bunch of negative charges, and this is my Gaussian surface. Basically, again, if I have an external field, lines produced like this. Oops, actually my picture is not exactly the very best. Well, or maybe not. I mean, I'm going to have field lines coming in, converging to these guys. But maybe I could also have some field line that was coming 
out and would end up whatever, doing something crazy. But bottom line is, I'm going to have more field lines getting in than getting out. And so I would expect my electric flux to be negative. Finally, if I have a region in space and the charge inside is zero, That means that, on, a pr on our example, that the number of field lines getting inside is going to be the same as the number of field lines getting outside. And I would expect the flux to be zero. So these are the ideas of the electric flux uh, used in Gauss law. Now, in a practical matter, we don't just draw crazy whatever surfaces. Those Gaussian surfaces are um, geometrical things that we, that we draw to help us build the field. And there is a technique where we can draw conveniently shaped Gaussian surfaces that will help us produce, will help us in calculating the electric field. That technique is going to be explained and explored in the second portion of this lecture, where we're going to see the, uh, when we're going to calculate the electric field created by a point charge, by a uniform char sphere charged, by a plane of charge, by a line of charge, I think these are the four examples I'm going to discuss. Okay, and then we're going to learn how to draw, how to choose the convenient surface to be my Gaussian surface, and then how to work this through. Watch the next video.